further ado, I'm going to introduce Michael G Zero POT. Uh, he hasn't given me a taster of uh, <laughs> uh, how he's going to run his talk tonight, but I'm going to hand over to Michael yeah. and uh, let him. Uh, uh, take it away. So over to you, Mike. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, join you guys tonight. And what a, a mixed community as well. I wasn't expecting such a, a diverse range of people. I see Germany, US, Spain, South America, Belgium um, on the call. I don't know whether I've missed any there, but um, right, let me start sharing my screen. So I'm going to... Um, just get somebody to confirm that you guys can see that before I go too much further. Yes, we can. You can? Good. And um, there's going to be plenty of time at the end for questions. However, I don't mind if you have a burning question in the middle, please feel free to unmute and, and ask. Um, I've also got the text uh, window up so you can always ping me um, something in the chat window but I will apologize if I don't spot it straight away because it's in just in the corner of my eye, eye line so uh, I may miss it. Um, so good evening everyone Michael G0POT. I'm um, part of a, a radio amateur group um, in central southern England called Newbury and District Amateur Radio Club. Um, Wanted to talk tonight to you guys about SOTA summits on the air. So not, not sofas on the air, if you were thinking you're going to have a nice cosy ride of it this evening. Summits on the air. I know from giving this talk at the RSGB convention where I discovered almost everybody in the audience was an avid SOTA operator. So I'm going to guess a few of you out there are actually keen portable operators and keen SOTA operators already. And I think when we can't get out there and do it ourselves, um, it's lovely to listen to people talking about stuff that we like doing and uh, to compare how they, they, they do these things and um, try and pick up some tips. So. If there's any of you out there who are avid SOTA operators and you hear me say something tonight you disagree with, feel free to butt in and um, share your expertise. So this evening, let me see if I can get this working. Let me just, ooh, there we go. So what I'm going to do is take you on a little bit of a whistle stop tour through SOTA. What it is, and probably just as important, what it isn't. Um, why you might want to do it and certainly why I love doing it and basically how to do it and when we talk about how to do it I'm going to split it into two separate parts there's for a lot of us the actual going outdoors climbing hills walking part and then there's the actual portable operating and they're two completely separate things and it's important that we uh, do both of them justice when we're going to get up on a hill and do a little bit of uh, summits on the air activity. So what exactly is SOTA? It's not a contest. So some people think it's a, a contest and if you listen to a SOTA operator you may think it sounds a little bit contesty. The way we operate can sound a little bit short and punchy and, and you'll reason why, you'll, you'll understand why as we carry on. It's basically an awards program to encourage portable operation, but specifically from hilly and mountainous locations. Now, I think the idea was originally, it's just turned 18 actually, it's just become an adult um, this year. And the idea was originally um, thought up by a chap called John Linford, uh, G3WGV. And, and I got the impression that um, he was kicking it around for some time before he saw um, Richard, so uh, 3G CWI. Many of you will know Richard from the owner of being the owner of Soda Beams. Um, he saw Richard's Adventure Radio website, and that encouraged in it, him in, into making contact um, and talking to Richard about the seed of, I, of, of an idea. And the two of them got together and fleshed it out into um, the the early iteration of what was Soda. And in the early days, of course, that was just set up in the UK. But now um, it operates in, uh, I think, uh, over 170, 180 um, associations across 76 different countries, which is just amazing. There's, there's hardly a, I don't think there is a country, hardly a country without, um, without some sort of social activity. So it's become incredibly, um, in incredibly interesting. People have really gone for it. So how does it work? What, what, what's it actually all about? 
Well, you can kind of divide it up into two halves. There's the activators. They're the virile young men and women who actually get out, climb up hills and mountains, set up their radio station and operate. And then there are the chasers. They're the hot chocolate swilling, slipper wearing, sofa sitting sloths, sat back in their nice warm, cozy shacks, doing, doing the actual chasing, trying to work the people up on the hilltops. And, um, and as an activator, I have to say, God bless every one of you chasers, because without you, my all the effort that I go to climbing up um, hills and mountains would be completely wasted. So I really, really appreciate the chases. But th there's those two very different sides to it. Qualifying hills are worth points. So that immediately raises two questions. What are qualifying hills and what are these points? So the basic rules say to qualify as a SOTA summit, a summit has to have a prominence of 150 meters. That is, from the top, from the highest point of the, the hill, it has to have a drop off on all sides of at least 150 meters. Now, it doesn't have to be immediate. My local hill, Walbury Hill, is actually on a ridgeway. So front and back, the drop off is, is, is within a few hundred meters. But side to side, uh, the drop off is a few kilometers away. It's quite a long ridgeway. But it has to drop off by 150 meters to be classed as a summit. Now there are some countries, if you've traveled in the Netherlands or in Denmark, you will realize that they don't really have a lot of really tall hills. In fact, I think I was walking in the Denmark Alps without even realizing I'd gone up a hill. Um, so they really, some countries really struggle. In those cases, um, there, there is a, a, an alleviation of the rules and they can have a prominence of just 100 metres. So the idea is to try and be as inclusive as possible to all countries who want to take part. But on the whole, 150 metres prominence is the definition of a summit. And each summit is worth a number of points. It's either one, two points, four points, six points, eight points or 10 points. And the number of points allocated to a summit are broadly speaking related to its height, but not exactly. So there are some other rules where um, in each association, in each geographical area, um, the, the, the kind of governing body of um, SOTA try to ensure that there's a good range of hills. So they don't want too many 10 pointers, but they don't want none at all. So they try and um, arrange the ranking so that you have a, a reasonable selection of all. Uh, here in England, we're not so lucky. We don't have a lot of very tall hills. Um, if I want to work a 10 point hill, I really need to start getting into um, Wales and Scotland. But um, uh, I know you guys over in the US, you have plenty of options open to you and uh, some amazing walking and outdoors over there. So um, you're very, very lucky. Now, when it comes to earning these points, as an activator, I can go and activate my local hill, and my local hill is worth one point. I can go and activate that hill, and to activate it, I have to make at least four contacts. So that's the basic rule. I make four contacts, I've classed as activating the hill. I, in reality, might make 40, I might make more, um, but I only have to make four to officially class as, a, as an activation. I can't make contacts through repeaters. They have to be direct, or at least terrestrial repeaters. They have to be direct contacts. I can operate through a satellite though, if I want to. Um, and I can use any mode I like. So I'm not restricted just voice or CW. I can use data modes. So I could use anything, anything you can imagine. All bands, all modes. I earn that point for, for operating and that's it for me for 12 months. I can go and operate from that hill again if I want, and I can give that point away to chasers, but I won't earn another point for that summit in a 12 month period. And you might think, well, that's a bit harsh. That's, that's, that's tough, and it is. But the idea is it's to encourage me as an activator to travel around and operate from different hills. So it encourages me to get out there and move around and operate all the hills that I possibly can. And that way I can earn points for every hill that I go to. From a chaser's perspective, 
they get to operate from home and they're trying to make contact with the people who are on the summits and they will earn the points of that summit every single day if they like. So they can contact me one day and earn that one point and they can contact my colleague who's operating there the next day and they will earn a second point for the same summit. So they can continually earn points for the same summits. And the reason for that is we want to encourage chasers. We want to encourage chasers to keep chasing. And if we made a rule where they could only earn the point once, they wouldn't bother trying to make a contact with it again. So it works out quite nicely. That encourages the chasers to chase and it encourages the activators to move around and operate from different summits. As you can see, earning chaser points is a lot easier than earning activator points. Um, and therefore, we, they have them as kind of separate certificates, if you like. You can be a shack sloth or you can be a mountain goat. The last category is kind of a, a bit of a halfway house between the two. If I'm on a summit, I can chase somebody on another summit. So if I'm on a summit and I hear another SOTO operator, I can try and contact them and have a summit to summit contact um, and earn summit to summit points. And they're, all, they're even rarer than activation points because it's, um, it's quite hard working another portable station when you're portable and both of you are, uh, are using compromised antennas and very low power. Um, they also, the, the scheme also offers um, what they call a seasonal bonus. So here in the UK, we tend to talk about this as a winter bonus because here in the UK, we get a bonus um, for four months of the year from I think it's the end of November to the end of March, where if you operate from a hill that's worth more than two points or more, you can get an additional three points. And the idea is it's to encourage you to get up there in the wind, rain and snow and activate summits. And it gives you a few extra points for every summit you, you activate. In other countries, that might not be the winter. That might be the summer is the more challenging time of the year or the monsoon season is the more challenging time of the year. So it's up to individual countries um, to, to decide when they want to have their bonus period and if they're going to run one. But it is there as a, an availability. So that's the basics of how it works. It's all about encouraging people to get out and, and operate and encouraging the, the chasers to chase. So why, why do it? Why, why do I do it as an operator? Well, obviously I do it for the fantastic views, feeling the sun on my face, the, the light breeze, or in this case, because I live in the UK and it's the weather's miserable and we have so much of it, um, I get to see a few feet into cloud. <laughs> um, I think it's probably about uh, 50, 60 kilometer hour wind where I am on, on this um, Welsh summit. Um, if you could see the picture clearly enough, you could see my glasses are completely fogged up. I can't see. Um, this, this is probably more the reality for um, many of the summits we, we operate. But sometimes it really does come good. Um, th there's something nice about the climb. This picture is taken, I, I operated from Snowdonia in North Wales, which is um, a, a mountain range. Um, this photograph is taken from the top. Now I know we've got um, Tristan, you're, you're Welsh and you're going to hate my pronunciation, so I'm so sorry. But um, this photograph is taken from the top of Ur uh, um, and I'm looking to the right there, the snowy peak is what we would traditionally call Snowdon. I think the Welsh called Ur Weaver. <laughs> I hope that's right. Um, and the smaller one over to the left is um, Ur Aran. So um, I was very lucky this day uh, operating. I'd crawled up to the top of this summit on my hands and knees through the snow and rocks. Um, I was on my own. I got these fantastic views out towards the North Sea. Um, it was, uh, and uh, I think it was, it was sub-zero here, but there was actually um, a 80 kilometer an hour wind with a wind chill factor of minus 20. And when I got to the top of Snowden, I really felt that. But here on top of this hill, the wind was hitting it, riding up the side and creating a little bubble of peace and calm at the top. And I, I sat here in absolute peace with hardly a breath of wind on me. Um, and my radio and operated CW from the, from the mountaintop, it was fantastic. And, and these are the days that you really, really remember. So if you fancy doing it, how do you get started? What's the best way to get started with SOTA? Well, I would recommend that you start by doing some chasing. 
that way you're going to get to listen to how good operators operate and you'll realize that when you're chasing SOTA stations they're small stations tend to be low power slightly less than, than efficient antennas bits of wire thrown up in trees held up with fishing poles they're not loud stations and you're going to realize that good operating from the summit activator is really really important in your ability to copy them and the information they're sending so doing a little bit of chasing is a really good idea so how do we go about finding some stations to chase? Well, I'd start first of all with SOTAwatch.org, which is a spotting site for SOTA. And by the way, I'm going to cover a few different SOTA um, websites tonight. Uh, rather frustratingly, they're all in different sites. However, at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna give you a URL which will take you to kind of a jump page from where you can reach all of them. So you don't need to worry about all the different URLs. I'll give you one right at the end, which kind of gives you a jump box to the whole lot. But we're gonna start with SOTA Watch, and this is a basic spotting site. And this is going to allow us to see um, where operators are uh, in real time. So um, hopefully you can see my little magic marker there on the page. Um, what we have at the top half of the page here is the latest spots and at the bottom we have upcoming activations and you can open this up to see all of the latest spots or all of the upcoming activations and for each one you have time and date of course you have the call sign of the activator and then you have this magic number which is the summit reference and the summit reference is made up of a country or an association so in the UK it will be G for England, um, GW for Scotland, GI for Ireland and GM for Scotland. In the US it's more broken up than that I think you have it um, spread over specific counties um, or, or larger regional areas like that so um, uh, that there are a lot of different associations within the um, American area. So in this case, W4C is the Carolinas, which is, I think, on the south, southeast USA. I hope I got that right. Um, then you have a two digit, which gives you a region, in this case, CM Central Mountains. And this is the first um, summit in that region. Uh, here in the UK, for instance, my local hill is G slash SE001. So that's G for England, SE for Southeast 001. So that's your hill reference, and that's what you're going to pass to the activator is going to pass to chases. But we can see where the operator is, what summit they're on. If you actually hover over that um, in on the real web page, it tells you how many points the summit's worth. So you know the really important ones that you want to chase that are worth 10 points. It tells you what frequency they're operating on and what mode they're using. So if you're not a CW operator, if you just want to do voice, you can immediately get down to where the, the voice operators are. And as I said, there's a bit at the bottom which tells you of upcoming activations. So if you're thinking, oh, I, I might have an hour later on today to do a bit of operating, you can have a quick look in advance to see, are there going to be any SOTA activations where people have um, plotted a, an intent to, to activate that I can come and, uh, come and chase. You do have to be careful, of course, they're going to put a time there when they think they're going to be active. But if you're doing a, a, a summit which maybe takes three, four hours to walk to the top of and get set up on, you can very easily be plus or minus an hour or more out. So um, be aware of that. Um, so that's the, the, how we go about finding people to chase. And you can listen in, and as I said, you can hear the difference between good operators, bad operators, what you can hear, what you can't hear, how the chases work, how good chases, um, it, it is a bit like doing uh, just normal DX, where you're working out how do I get on the list, when do I call, what are the optimum way of calling so that I get picked up. Um, it is just like DXing. So you've had a go at chasing and you think, do you know, I fancy a little go at, um, oh yes, sorry, someone's just um, <laughs> put in 150 meters, uh, 492 feet. Um, Sue and Chuck, thank you very much. I forgot 
Um, you lovely guys in the US are Imperial. I will remember to throw in Imperial measurements um, as I go along from this point on. So, so sorry about that and thank you very much for, for picking me up on it. So you've had a little go at um, chasing. What about activating? So I've said our SOTA summits that we can operate from have to have a prominence of 150 meters or 492 feet. Um, so how do we go about finding a, a local summit? And it's good to start local because as we all know, if we've gone out and tried a little bit of portable operating, the first time you get to a location to do portable operating, you realize you've forgotten the power lead, the microphone, uh, the coax, something vital um, that scuppers your, completely scuppers your, your, your portable operation. And if you're going to make that mistake, you want to do it really locally and not when you've climbed three or four hours at the top of a, a mountain. In fact, I always recommend people go and have your first portable operation in your local park or in your garden um, to work out what you need, what you've forgotten so that you can prepare. So the next um, website we're going to use is called sotamaps.org and this is going to help us find a local summit and what we can do is we can um, use the association drop down to choose a country and I've chosen Wales since I had those lovely photographs of Snowden a moment ago. Um, you can then choose a region and for instance England is split up into I think about 10 regions um, Scotland probably less, about five or six. I think I, Northern Ireland five or six. The US quite a lot. I don't actually know how many separate individual regions you have. Um, obviously per association, per county, um, it, it's not an enormous number but you will have a, a set of different regions. And in this case Wales has a north, uh, a middle and a south region. So North, uh, north Wales, Mid Wales and South Wales. When I do that, when I select North Wales, you'll notice that we now have a, a view and that has lots of little triangles on it, colour coded. So the dark blue are the one point summits, the light blue are the two point summits, the turquoise, I hope that is, are the four point summits, um, the green is the six point summits, yellow is eight, and then red are the ten point summits. So you can see at a, a quick glance where all the summits are and, and what sort of um, size and height and challenge they're going to be. So this is a great first step in planning. Where are we going to go? But before we leave, before we set off, we've got a little bit more work to do. So this is where I just want to do a quick diversion into a little bit of pre-planning because we, we, we need to do a few things before we actually leave the house and head for the summit. I want to talk a little bit about weather, temperature and clothing, a little bit about some basic safety tips. Now if you're operating in the UK I can see that a lot of the hills we go to you can literally drive to the top of them um, but you know they're, they're fairly benign hills there's a lot of people visiting them they're fairly safe but I'm going to run, just run through some basic safety stuff that I take with me and do um, and they're Good, they're always a good idea even if you're just doing a very simple hill. I'm going to talk a little bit about fitness. Um, I'm going to talk about finding your summit when you're on the hill and something called an activation zone. So we'll look a little bit about what an activation zone is in a minute and I just want to talk briefly about consideration to others when you're actually operating from the hilltop. So let's get back to our SOTA maps. Part of our planning. When you're on the website, if you hover over one of these little triangles, these summits, you get a little pop-up box, which just gives you a little bit of information about the summit. But when you click on that summit name, it's gonna take you to another website called summits.sota.org.uk. And this is an absolute goldmine of useful information. So it has a little bit of information about the summit you're looking at at the top of the page. But um, below it, for a, a lot of summits, it has links to blogs um, that other SOTA operators have written about their activation of that summit. It'll talk about where they parked, what the going was like, 
was there a, a clear track? Which path did they take up? Often with maps um, and trails marked that you can download, uh, GPS um, files that you can download. It'll talk about how high you have to climb, how far you have to walk, how long it took. Were there any special issues at the top of the hill, i.e. it's a tiny summit, you cannot get more than two people on it, or there's a paging station and you cannot operate two metres. So there's a wealth of information there and it's absolutely solid gold as part of planning your visit to a summit. Now in the unlikely case where they don't have links to people's um, blocks, you'll notice on the right hand side is the, the, the people who have operated there most recently, it just has a, the latest operations. And you would do worse than to just drop some of these people an email if you like, look them up on QRZ, drop them an email and say, hey, I'm thinking about operating from this summit. I see you did it recently. Can you tell me anything about it? because uh, most social operators will be more than happy to talk about um, the, their operations. Um, and then finally, at the bottom of this page, they have uh, a list of the different bands and how often they're used. And this can also be quite insightful. Again, if you see that um, nobody's operating HF from the top of a summit, it could indicate either there's absolutely no room or there's a lot of um, visitors there, which a lot of people, which make actually putting an HF antenna up almost impossible, um, or that there's a you know a government monitoring station and you're, you're not allowed to operate HF there. If there's no two meter activity, that normally means there's a packet station um, or local interference from some other kind of radio source. So it can be very very insightful and help you to plan um, what sort of activity you're going to have. What bands are you going to use? What radius do you want to take? And, and all that good stuff about where you're going to park, the, the route you're going to take. Uh, so what's Tristan saying? Have a look at my friend's SOTA website. Yes. Um, you, what you'll find when you start looking on here, you'll find that there are a few SOTA operators that are really good at keeping blogs of all the summits they go to. And they tend to be my, my go-to guys for um, reading up on a new, new summit. So very good. Right, so that's done some basic pre-planning. The next thing I do is go to the maps. So I do have Ordnance Survey maps for some areas of the country. I'm also going to be taking a GPS or a phone with maps on it, downloaded onto the phone. Not, I don't rely on having a data connection to use them. However, I'm going to take a paper map and I'll tell you why in a second. So I, in the UK, I can use something called streetmap.co.uk. I think many other countries have similar setups where you have maps with the contour line so you can see the height of the um, various parts of the hill. Um, these maps show me areas where I can park. They show me public rights of way, which can be really, really important. This is my local hill, Walbury. Um, you can see the blue trig point. This, uh, the trig point isn't always the highest point of the hill, but in, in Walbury's case, it is. Um, this is actually on private land. It's farmland. Um, and so having an idea of where the public rights of way are, are really, really useful. Uh, what's Bob asking? Which SOTA website do you use to post your planned or actual activation? Um, so if I'm going to plan, if I'm planning to do an activation, I use that um, SOTA watch um, website because it allows me to upload the details of which summit I'm going to go to, the day, the date, the rough time that I should be operating, the bands that I expect to operate on and the modes that I expect to operate on. So that communicates to everyone, um, you know, what, how I'm going to operate and where I'm going to be. So back to my map. Um, the, uh, the other important thing about having a, a map with contour lines is we talked about an activation zone a minute ago. Now, the rules of SOTA say that you have to operate within 25 vertical metres of the highest point of the summit. Now, that's 25 vertical metres, not horizontal metres. 25 horizontal meters would be very tight to the top of the summit and for some summits 
where they have a lot of visitors, you are going to be under people's feet and in their way. So the idea is to get you close to the summit, but to give you the flexibility to operate away from the, the main peak so that if there are a lot of other visitors, especially with children and dogs, um, you can stay, stay well out of their way because I find from personal experience, children and dogs don't work well with guy lines and the ends of HF antennas. Um, so it's, it's best to keep a bit of distance. So 25 uh, vertical meters in this case, so my uh, local hill 297 meters, that means I can operate down to 272 meters, uh, which gets me right down here and I can almost operate from both of those car parks um, if I wanted to. Um, it gives me quite a big area to operate from. While I'm talking about car parks, that's a great opportunity for me to mention operating from vehicles. So the idea of SOTA is that um, you have to be isolated. You're supposed to be portable operating, so you have to be isolated from a vehicle. So whereas in this situation, I probably could operate from a, a car park, um, the idea is I should be a, a distance, some distance from my car. I definitely shouldn't be using an antenna on the car or power from the car. I should be operating independently as a portable operator. Now, the caveat to that is um, one of the things I didn't say actually about how, um, how accessible SOTA is. If you are uh, disabled or have um, difficulty moving on uneven ground, SOTA is still quite uh, accessible to you as an activator because a lot of the summits do have car parks on them or very, very close to them. Now, as I said, the, the idea is that you don't operate from your vehicle. Um, however, you don't, if, if mobility is an issue, you don't have to move a great distance from it. You just have to not be using it as part of your setup. Um, so it is pretty accessible. Um, a key reason for doing maps. So as I said, I take a GPS with me um, and that's really, really handy. Uh, modern technology, uh, really useful for, for navigating. However, I never rely on it. It's got batteries in it, it's electronic, it can fail. So I always make sure I have a paper map of some description with me and a compass and the ability to use those things if I need to. The other really good reason for creating a map like this is I can give a copy to somebody else before I head out. So I give to my partner a copy of the map. I say, this is where I'm going to be parked and I mark it on the map. I put a dotted line to show where I'm going to actually the path I'm intending to take. Um, and I say, if you haven't heard from me, I should be operating at this time. I should be back to the car and on a phone by this time. If you haven't heard from me, please phone the police or the uh, mountain rescue um, and fax them or email them a copy of the map. And they can very quickly then go to that car park, see if my car's still there. And if it is, they know I'm stuck on the trail somewhere. So this is really useful for me as an activator, but also to other people as a security backup, just in case something happens. Okay, let's move on. Let's have a little look about um, clothing. So the weather at the top of a hill is always different from the weather at the bottom of the hill. It tends to be wetter, windier uh, and colder. Um, you, you really have to deal with a mix of both um, uh, sunstroke and hypothermia. You, you can get quite a wind chill. Um, you don't realise how that, it might only be a breeze, but it's quite sapping when you're sat still operating a radio for maybe an hour. It can be, it can be colder than you expect. Hypothermia is also, um, it's, it's difficult. It, it creeps up on you and you do not realise you're having problems. I've only had it once. I operated from a summit at night, which is a no-no, um, but I was in Cumbria. I wanted to take part in a six metre um, activity contest here in the UK. I set up just below the summit. It was windy and cold, but it was slightly sheltered below the, the, um, the ridgeway. Um, I operated, it's only a two hour contest, I operated for about an hour and a quarter before I suddenly realised I was struggling to um, write the call sign down quite as quickly and I was, I just thought my hands are cold, it's not just, just, just cold hands. About another 10 minutes in, 
I realized I was having to ask people to repeat their call sign quite often. And I realized that I couldn't actually remember a whole call sign when I heard it. And I realized that hypothermia was setting in um, and I needed to do something about it. And even then I was thinking to myself, well, I've only got, um, you know, 30 minutes to go. I'll just, I'll just, just keep pressing on. But you, you have to be really careful um, because it does just creep up on you. Similarly, if you're up on a hilltop, no tree cover, um, in, in the summer, you can very easily get heat stroke um, and uh, sunburn if you don't cover yourself up. So I tend to, when I'm walking, I tend to use a lot of layers. Um, at the bottom of the hill when I'm starting and I'm going to get hot, I'm stripping down to a thin layer. I tend to use shirts, so I've got something to cover my arms and a wide brim hat, something to keep the sun off my head. And as I climb up the hill, if it's a if it's a tall if it's a mountain, you will feel the temperature drop, and it's sometimes necessary to put a little bit more clothing on as you get towards the top. I pace myself. I don't want to sweat too much because you're going to get cold if you get too sweaty. So I try and pace myself, um, and then just before I come over the uh, the ridge of the the top of the summit, I tend to start putting some layers back on so that when I get to the summit, I've got layers and at least a windproof layer on to keep me warm while I get my radio kit set up. You have to remember you're going to be sat still for, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, depends on your operating setup. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you just need to be aware that um, it, you can cool down much quicker than you expect. So while we're on the subject of a little bit of safety let's go through just some of the quickly some of the things that I think are quite important um, when I'm operating from a summit so in the center here you can see my good old paper map and you you might not be able to see this I've got my car park marked I've got dotted lines showing the trail that I'm going to take and I've taken one of those with me plus I've got actual um, OS maps um, to take with me and I'm leaving one of these with um, with a responsible adult and telling them a time when they should have heard from me. Um, I take a little whistle this weighs absolutely nothing and costs very little and you might think well I can just shout but um, if you've been uh, if you've fallen and been shouting for an hour trying to attract people's attention you'll realize your voice uh, gives up after a while and also if you've slipped down an escarpment and you're trying to call back up to people who are on a windy ridge they will not hear you so having something a little bit high pitched is is quite useful and as I said this stuff lives in my bag so even if I'm going to like a, a really simple hill where people are pushing prams and you know it's it's there's no challenge to it all this gear is still in my bag anyway um, I take this this orange thing is uh, a, an emergency bothy bag it is effectively just a very thick bin liner that's bright orange and um, it will not keep me warm but it will keep the wind and the rain off me if I need to I could cut a head hole and arm holes in it and wear it like a jacket if I've fallen and I'm going to be stuck somewhere waiting for a couple of hours for mountain rescue to come and get me I can climb inside it um, just to keep the wind off me and the rain off me so it's just an extra little bit of protection and it's bright orange so everyone can see it and also when I'm sat in wet grass just operating <laughs> normally I can sit on it just to keep my my ass nice and dry. Um, I take a, a radio now I often operate HF and VHF when I'm operating VHF I have a VHF handheld that I'm going to use for the SOTR activation this is not the handheld I'm going to use for my SOTR activation. This is a, a second small emergency handheld that I throw in my bag. It's an extra, just in case I don't have phone coverage. It gives me something that I might be able to get into a repeater um, or raise a radio contact. It's not going to be the same two meter radio that I use for doing my SOTR activation because SOD's law, I'll run that baby flat doing the activation. And then when I need it for an emergency, it won't be any good. So I, I'm lucky, I've got a spare, I take it with me. Just buy a Baofang, buy something cheap if you need to have it as a spare radio. I don't know why I've got a glass of wine on there. That is not an emergency requirement. There you go, telephone is a re an emergency requirement. Um, here in the UK now, um, it doesn't matter what mobile network you're with, 
if you dial 999 from a phone, you don't even have to have a SIM in it um, with modern phones. No matter what phone you have, um, you will connect to, if, if you're in coverage of a network, it will allow you to connect to make an emergency call. Um, in the past, that wasn't the case. So I tended to take a spare mobile phone with me. I still do because I use my normal mobile phone for a GPS and mapping and for taking photographs and selfies of myself on the mountain top and all that kind of nonsense. Um, so having another one, uh, especially on a very, very long day out, um, just guarantees me something with some battery life left in it. Um, I take a torch. Now, as I said, I do not recommend operating on a hill at night, just straight out. Um, navigating back down hills in the dark is just a terrible idea. I've done it a couple of times. It's never, ever been good. I've done the classic foot in a rabbit hole, throw myself over the edge um, of a hill that that wasn't good. Um, and I've also had that problem where on the way up, you can visually see the route. You can see the, where people have walked. On the way back down by torchlight, you cannot see that. Um, and it makes it really, really hard descending. So I recommend not operating at night. However, I take a torch because if I get stuck, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, a flashlight. Um, I take a flashlight or a torch because if I get stuck somewhere, I've had an accident, A, I'm gonna feel much more comfortable with a little torch just to, just to keep me happy. So I've got a bit of light now and again. And also I can signal to someone when I hear a rescue party coming to say, hey guys, I'm over here. Um, I take a small um, medical kit. This is just a tiny, it's an Ortley one. It's in a waterproof packet. Um, I tend to put all of my stuff inside little waterproof bags in my rucksack because I've been out in some terrible weather on terrible hills with strong winds and the, the wet gets in everywhere. So I've got a little um, waterproof uh, medical kit here. Um, you know, you cut yourself on barbed wire. Um, there's, there's always something going on that, uh, that, that it's useful. You may get a blister. So having some plasters is useful. Also, it's really handy to have bandages and plasters for attaching antennas to the top of telescopic uh, fishing poles I found when you've forgotten to bring your um, PVC tape. So um, everything is useful when you're a radio amateur. Uh, finally, just a few little things. Sunscreen, uh, sun cream, I tend to always chuck on a little bit of um, sun protection, even on fairly overcast days. I mean, we're talking here in England, you know, it's 12 degrees and drizzly most days. So um, we, we don't really uh, have those sunny days. But yeah, make sure you keep yourself protected. You, if you're going to be out for three, four hours walking, you are going to get the sun. Having had some nibbles in the past, I have some little anti-bite um, uh, lotion that I can put on. I take some energy bars, um, take some food. Let me just put my light back on again. So I'm illuminated. I take some food, so I've got some um, energy just in case I need a, bo a boost. I haven't shown water on here. Um, obviously, you need liquid, especially when you're walking a long way. You're going to sweat. You do need to keep hydrated. Um, I know camel packs um, where you have a basically a bladder that um, goes in your backpack. They're very, very popular and very handy to, to carry on your back. I don't like them for long walks. And the reason is you cannot monitor how much you're drinking effectively. And I made this mistake, funnily enough, the first time I went to the top of Mount Snowden, I carried a unicycle to the top of Mount Snowden and unicycled back down the mountain. Um, but I drunk all my water from my camel pack by the time I reached the summit because I couldn't monitor my usage. So I tend to take individual water bottles, um, I can carry one in my hand with the rest in the back. I can monitor my usage, make sure I'm drinking enough and not too much. Obviously, always make sure you take that rubbish home with you. So all goes back in the backpack afterwards. But yeah, I tend to prefer to take um, water bottles. Uh, that is everything on the emergency page. Walking fitness, just uh, very quickly. Um, being fit and being able to walk a long distance is not the same as walking on hills, especially steep hills and mountains. Uh, it, it's, it's a different dynamic. You'll feel it in your tendons. It stretches the fronts and backs of your legs in ways that you weren't expecting. Um, so hill walking fitness is different than normal walking fitness. Um, I do recommend starting off simple, doing simple hills. You'll, you'll 
feel what you can achieve and what you can't. Don't go straight for a, a straight from the sofa to a mountain. I guess that goes without saying. But um, uh, and when I'm going to go and do a, a big event like you know uh, walking ten hours in the mountains, I spend the the month or so before that actually doing some training walks on any steep area that I can possibly find locally just to get my legs used to it and get everything stretched so that I'm not going to have any problems when I get to the hill. Right, finding the activation zone. So you remember the activation zone, 25 vertical meters from the summit. So potentially quite a broad area. You would think when you're on a hill, Finding the activation zone is going to be really easy. You just keep walking uphill, surely. I've been on some hills where it's actually much tougher than you'd expect. Um, the tops of hills aren't always just pointy. Sometimes they're oddly shaped and you're not sure whether you're on the, the summit or just another lump that's nearby the summit. The visual distance can sometimes drop very, very low. If you're in the clouds, um, visibility can drop down to just a few meters. Um, so, so being able to navigate is really, really important. And actually navigating in those situations with a map and compass is almost impossible. It's really hard. Um, I know there are other techniques for, for navigating in those situations, um, but I like to take a little GPS with me. And as I said, I use a GPS on my phone. I have the maps downloaded. I do not rely on a data connection to be able to update those maps. Um, because yes, yeah, really, those, those four summits are really annoying, especially when you, you've struggled your way up to what you think is a summit and then you discover there's another 100 meters of climb the other side of it to go. Um, Yes, so I, I try to um, have something that's got the maps downloaded so they're local to me, but be prepared for that to break, that to fail. And, and an example I can give of that is when I did the, that, that picture I showed you earlier where I'm at the top of, um, of Clueth, uh, that mountain, I said it was sub-zero. Um, and the walk across to the summit of um, Snowdon was, was even colder. When I took my phone out of my pocket, it went from 80% battery to 20% battery in about five minutes, just from temperature. So temperature makes an enormous difference with batteries. Um, and you can suddenly find that you've got nothing to work with. Now, obviously you can put your phone back in your pocket, warm it back up and hey presto, um, it's as if it's recharged, but uh, you, you can end up with the same issue with radios as well. But just be aware if you're using your phone, um, you know, to call people, to do a bit of GPS, to take photographs, um, it's easy, easy to drop the battery down very quickly. And if you do have a bit of a plunge in temperature, um, that can end up shutting down your, uh, your phone. Right, let us move on to the more interesting bit, I think. We want to talk about radios um, and, and actually operating, don't we? So let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the actual operating. Let's look at um, radios, batteries and aerials. We'll talk a little bit about modes and maybe what modes we're going to get the most out of. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about spotting and logging. So let's have a look at some radios. Now, people often say to me, what's the best radio for, for SOTA? And the answer is always the one you've already got, or preferably the one you've already got that you're happy to carry to the top of a, a mountain. If you've got a K4, I'm not sure you're going to want to take your Craft K4 to the top of a mountain. But if you've got an 817, an 857, um, an ICOM 703, 706, some, something like that, they're great radios just to get up and have a go. Go and give it a go. Even if, even if it's just a handheld, go and have a go at some SOTA. Go and have a go at operating from the summit and see if you like it. And if you like it, see what it is you like about it and what might make your life easier. So I've done quite a bit and I've, I love my little CW radios. I'm going to confess, I'm not a great CW operator, but I love it. Um, and I love my little spy, spy type radios, the mountain toppers, um, the China kit radio I've got there. I've got um, uh, SW Labs, what's Small Wonder Labs. I've, I've got lots of little, you know, the KX1 um, there and the HB1B. I've got lots of little radios and I love them. And um, they're, they're great as uh, SOTA radios because they weigh nothing and they're very, very effective. 
Um, I do recommend having something multi-band. You don't want to get to your summit and find that there's a Russian 20 meter contest going on and there's no room on the band. He says, having had that experience, because it's really depressing having traveled quite a distance and climbed a very big hill to find yourself stuck with only one band and nobody can hear you. So I definitely recommend having some options, even if it's just an HF set and a hand held for VHF. Um, I'm lucky because I've got some of these little mini radios. What I can do is take the KX3 as my main radio, but also throw in a mountain topper um, uh, MTR3B as a, as a backup, should something go wrong, so that I've got a second radio with me, because it weighs nothing. Um, weatherproofness is obviously an issue. You're going to be um, outdoors, potentially in wet or inclement conditions. There's mud, there's grit. Um, if, you, if you're feeling precious about your radio, you're going to have to do something to try and protect it. But I recommend finding a radio that you don't need to feel too precious about because you will drop it, it will get muddy, it will get rained on. Um, that's just part and parcel of operating um, on a hilltop. Um, Multi-mode versus single mode. So the, these little CW only radios are fantastic, but obviously if you want a bit of flexibility, something like um, an 817, 818, um, 857, KX3 are fantastic uh, because you've obviously got the multi-mode you can you can do what you want um, and that gives you a little bit more flexibility what does here um richard say super radio is best for vhf with other high power transmitters on summits okay yeah good um sdrs have bad front end rejection unless you um use a band pass filter yeah okay um yeah i mean for my personal choice i like good quality radios regardless um uh, yes notwithstanding trying to battle with a paging site um and actually uh, that's a good point when it comes to handhelds i know biofangs are really cheap and and you know they, they work but actually they're not great in interference conditions and i'd much rather rely on you know one of my kind of yacy icon kenwood type of two meter handhelds than something like a biofang if I am operating from a hilltop where I have got something like paging interference. They do tend to work a little bit, um, a little bit better. Um, I recommend headphones. Um, if you're on top of a hill and it's blowing a gale, it can be really hard to hear. Um, I've, <laughs> I've had, I operated from a summit where I was um, near a muddy track, which ended up being um, a green lane route for motorcyclists. And a group of them broke down near me and decided to spend 20 minutes revving their, trying to rev their engines to, to get started while I was in the middle of um, a pileup. So headphones, an absolute must. Be aware of wind noise if you're a, a voice operator and you'll hear that when you do some chasing. You'll hear people who operate from hills and they don't manage the wind well and it makes it really, really hard to hear you. So either mod your mic with um, like a, a dead rat, dead cat, those things that people put over microphones, the hairy thing um, to try and muffle the noise. Maybe mod a mic like that or just be aware, hold your coat up. Um, I sometimes I have like a little travel blanket, a little tiny thing, and I stick that on the fence behind me so that I can screen my microphone from the wind while I'm talking. So there are some little techniques you can do to minimize the, the wind noise on microphones. Um, you're operating in direct sunlight typically, so make sure that your uh, display works well in the sun. Um, things like the KX3 uh, you know, are fantastic, they work well. The HB1B is actually super bright. Um, the, the KX1 is maybe a little bit harder to see, but a lot of these little radios also have um, audible and enunciation of um, things like frequencies, so you can make use of that if you need to. Uh, just as an example of weight, so, um, you know, if you want to, depending on how far you're going, if you're only talking, um, you know, you're only going to walk 20 minutes, you, you don't mind lugging a, an FT817 or a KX3. You know, this is um, uh, 1.2 kilograms. I got to do pounds as well, haven't I? 2.7 pounds. Uh, this is about a kilogram, so 2.2 pounds. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not heavy radios, but if you're 
doing a serious mountain climb they you do feel it after a while and with these bigger radios you probably find you need bigger batteries as well um, especially if you're going to be operating voice the mtr uh, mountain topper 3b here um, weighs what does that weigh let me just find some weights about 130 grams so about four and a half ounces um, and in fact my whole station so that's got a key on the side um, the the radio the battery my headphones um, all the leads that i need not including the aerial um, my whole station weighs 315 grams or 11 ounces so if i'm doing some serious climbing that's a great radio to take and also i can throw it in as a second radio without taking any weight adding any weight really whatsoever um, what's William say? Soda Beams has a VHF item that seems to negate um, the pager, can only do 10 watts. Yeah, I think they've introduced um, some sort of filter, I think, haven't they? I've not, um, since Richard's retired, I, he used to send me all his gear to review, but um, since he's retired, I've, uh, I've not seen anything, so um, I've been missing out. So talking of Richard and Soda Beams, let's, let's talk about some aerials because Soda Beams do a lot of aerials and uh, they, they're obviously aimed at the, um, the, the, the mountain topper. So for two meters, if I'm operating um, either the 817 or even a handheld, I tend to try and take an external antenna. Now you can do really well just on the normal rubber duck of a, a handheld, um, but I find an external antenna really does help. Um, I use, this is actually a copy of the Soda Beams multifunction dipole. Um, it, the Soda Beams don't make them anymore, so I just basically copied the design. And it's essentially just um, a couple of meters of coax and it's split the inner and the outer at the end. Um, and you end up with, uh, and you just use plastic water pipe or electrical conduit um, to create a, a framework to, to hold that. Um, and you can set it up, let me uh, go on to the next slide, you can set it up as a, a vertical, so here's it stuffed into the side of my backpack as a vertical, or if I'm operating SSB or CW, I can set it up as a horizontal. So it's a very flexible antenna, and it is just basically coax, there's, you can just see the inner there going into the top half of the antenna, and it's just the braid in the, the bottom half. Obviously only um, about 50 centimeters long when it's all packed down, um, uh, weighs less than a pound, I guess, so about half a kilogram. So it's very little weight to it at all. And that's a great, it, that, that will work on two meters and 70 SEMs, and it's a great option uh, for those bands just to give me a little bit more performance on the antenna side of things. Um, for HF, now I try to use tuned antennas and the reason is I don't want to a carry the weight of an aerial tuning unit and b forget the bit of coax that goes from the aerial tuning unit to my radio <laughs> which I've done and c um, have something that can break or get water in it and become um, less optimal than it should be so I try to always use pre-tuned antennas so I do all this building and testing uh, somewhere locally. Um, the first times I've used these antennas, I've taken measuring gear as well so that I can just double check everything's tuned, that no matter where I set it up, hilltop field, whatever I do, it's going to work correctly. And then I don't need to worry about taking SWR meters or, or nonsense like that with me to a summit. So what I've got here is um, a 10 meter telescopic pole. Now this is actually quite heavy. I, I've got to say it's about 1.3 kilograms, so um, uh, about 2.9 pounds. Um, it's, it's great because it's 10 meters long rather than six or seven, like most of the, the smaller telescopic antennas, but it, a telescopic mast, but it does weigh quite a bit. Um, but uh, this is, the slightly shortened version so rather than being you know a couple of about two meters when it's collapsed it's only about um, a meter long so it just about fits in my backpack um, I'm using here I've got um, a linked dipole so I'm using a dipole with links in it to give me multi-band I want to be able to operate it on multiple bands and I tend to take 
um, 40, 30 and 20 meters with me because typically one of those bands will be good. Um, 20 meters might give me good um, contacts during the daytime. Um, if 20 is dead, then 40 is typically open for local UK contacts, maybe into Europe. And if there's a massive contest on and 40 and 20 are full, I can jump to 30 and be guaranteed of some space. Um, so that's a really good combination for me. And I guess if you're a voice operator, you might want to throw 17 meters in instead to give you a, a walk band so you know there's not going to be any contests. Um, this, this antenna uses uh, links. The downside to that is every time I want to change frequency, I have to stand up, drop the antenna, adjust the links, but it's, it's a compromise. Um, I'm using uh, RG174 coax, which is thin and very lightweight. It's obviously more lossy than RG58, but pound for pound, and literally pound for pound, I don't really want to carry up a great lump of RG58. Um, I've probably got about 12 meters on this reel. It's literally just enough to come down from the top of that mast to, a, you know, basically the bottom of the, the mast. I'm going to sit right next to it. So I don't have to carry any more of this coax. I absolutely have to. But the RG174 um, does help kind of alleviate the, the lightness and the space it takes up. I don't guy my mast separately with guys and then hang an antenna on it. I use the antenna as the guy. So two, the two parts of my dipole form two legs of my guying, and then I've got another piece of um, cord that I'm going to use for the, the third guy. So that gives me quite a, a straightforward setup. Um, if you're operating somewhere with trees, you can hoof a line over a tree, I guess. Uh, maybe take a catapult to get a line over a tree. I've just found that um, uh, the variety of hilltops I do, I've, I've never found um, trying to get a line over a tree to be um, an effective and um, quick and easy means of getting an antenna up. I, I much prefer to take um, a pole. And you also see I've got some very long Velcro straps attached to that pole, which means if there's a, a wooden post somewhere nearby, I can actually strap it to a post. I don't even need to worry about guys. So that's uh, that's really good. Um, all in all, as I said, the travel mast about um, 1.3 kilograms, uh, almost three pounds. Um, the 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 antenna itself with the coax is about um, 600 grams, so about a pound and a half ish. Um, so so it's it's not heavy, but it's also not light. I'm operating QRP. Um, you don't have to. You can go for a bit more power, in which case you might want to upgrade the um, the weight of everything in your antenna, slightly slightly heavier duty wire and uh, balance and things like that if you use them. Um, but on the basis of battery um, usage and everything else, I'm going to operate QRP. So I'm 10 watts voice maximum and 5 watts CW maximum. Um, my actual antenna that I'm using these days is an N-fed half wave. Um, so this is basically a three band N-fed half wave. It's got um, Pico traps from Soto Beams, which are the tiny little toroids and little surface mount capacitor to create a trap. Um, I've wound a little 60 to one ballon in, in this box, and that's my coax. It's about 50 centimeters couple of feet um, for, for the coax and that's it that's the whole antenna no counterpoise nothing else just the wire which I put up is an inverted V typically and the transformer and that little bit of coax that weighs um, about I don't know two three hundred grams so I guess um, four five ounces four ounces something like that um, that's that's very very light and and these days I, I take a much smaller um, a much smaller mast which I've got here which is a carbon fiber fishing rod and you might think oh hang on a minute carbon fiber that's not good for antennas is it but if you're using it to hold up an inverted V absolutely fine and it tends to be a little bit more um, rigid. 
Uh, Jim, sorry, I missed your question. Where does your peanut power traps and fed halfway stand in your current list of favorite antennas? Yeah, it's still my go-to antenna. I use it for SOTA. I use it when I'm traveling. I work between the UK and Portugal and Italy. Um, so I take it all with me when I'm traveling because it's tiny and takes up no room in my, um, in my travel bag. Um, I did set it up on a whisper, whisper transmitters. I set up the dipole and I set up the NFED half wave to compare them and ran that for about uh, four or five hours, I think. Um, the dipole, you really can't go wrong with. The dipole is probably as efficient as you're going to get. It's lovingly repeatable. No matter where you put it up, it will be tuned as you expect. Whereas if you go for ground plane and verticals, it can be a little bit uh, variable. Um, the dipole was fractionally better than the NFED half wave, but you know, not enough for me to care about. And this is so light and so tiny like this that it's still my, my most favorite antenna and because it's got the pico traps in it i don't even have to stand up to change bands so it's fantastic right let's talk a little bit about batteries and keys now we I, actually let's talk about modes as well here so um typically voice and cw tend to be the um the predominant modes used from um, summits. There are some people that use data modes now, especially because you can do it from phones and tablets. Um, if you can set that up, it's quite efficient. You're obviously, again, you've got battery issues that you need to think about with that and being able to see the screen of the tablet on a sunny hilltop, uh, which is a bit of a challenge, but it does open up some more options for you. I would say that data and CW are going to be your best bang for buck when it comes to making the most of your power. Um, and as I said before, I tend to limit myself to QRP because the more power you use, the more battery you need to take with you. The more battery, the more weight. Um, happily, happily, we've moved on now from sealed lead acid batteries, the slabs. Um, seven amp slabs used to be the, seemed to be the go-to battery. And I definitely use those a lot. And I tended to have to take two just in case one failed um, or because I knew it wasn't going to last me the whole operation. So two lead acid batteries was a hell of a weight. Um, they're, they're, they're not light at all. These days, I tend to use something like a Life FIPO, um, which is the lithium, what is it, um, iron phosphate, lithium iron phosphate, um, LIFEPO4. Um, so this is a 4,200 milliamp, uh, 4.2 amp hour um, Life FIPO. It weighs about a pound, so it's about 485 grams. Um, so not a bad weight actually, it's not bad at all. And that will run the 817 at two and a half watts for four hours in a contest. So for a, a SOTA operator, <laughs> that's, that's more than enough. Um, you know, even if you do a, a lot of, make a lot of contacts, you're probably not going to flatten that. Um, with all these little lithium batteries, I also tend to use the little plug-in battery monitors. It just monitors the um, voltage of the individual cells because if an individual cell drops in voltage you can damage your battery um, so I leave that running on the battery when I'm using it and I can just see that all the cells are at about the same um, same voltage and that it's not uh, failing one of them for the um, at mountain topper and for these little CW radios you can get away with much much smaller I mean the mountain topper I take that little this is a 460 milliamp hour lipo battery it weighs 50 grams that's about one and a half uh, no 1.8 ounces um, so it weighs absolutely nothing which is why my whole station when i use the mtr is is so light um, you know and even if you're using something like the kx1 or hp1b you know you only need um you know uh, one amp hour is is more than enough Think about how long you're going to operate for, um, what your operating kind of technique is going to be. Uh, you can kind of get a feel for how much power you're going to, to need. And if you're only going to be up there operating for 30 minutes or an hour, um, then you don't need to be carrying an awful lot of weight in batteries. But uh, definitely data modes or CW, I would say, give you the best results for, um, for, for the amount of energy you're going to take with you and the amount of RF you're going to put out. On the, on the subject of CW, keys, 
you're probably not going to want to take your Begali, um, you know, whatever they have these days, traveller to the top of a hill because um, they're very, very expensive and your key is going to get wet and corrode and full of mud and grass. Um, unfortunately, I, I love the German palm paddles. Um, I know they've stopped trading. I don't know whether somebody is going to pick up their um, designs and be able to carry on developing those and producing them. I hope they will because they were absolutely fantastic. I know a lot of people copy these designs using 3D printers um, and you can certainly make something that works quite well. Um, I, this is a, a, a what they call a bathtub key. I think this was out of a Wellington bomber, Second World War bomber. Um, it's a Second World War key. Um, it's completely enclosed. So it and it's actually as a straight key. It's actually a pleasure to send on. It's quite a nice action. Um, and I love the the knob design because you've got a bit of a rim, a skirt around the edge, which I. I, I like as a key. I'm not very keen on just a button. I like a skirt. I like a skirt on my knob, apparently. Um, so, so the bathtub key makes an excellent um, Soto Summit key because it's completely enclosed. You can throw that in your rucksack, um, bash it around, and actually it survives really well. Obviously, these palm keys, you can push the paddles inside the main body, uh, and that protects the, the key to a certain extent. Um, the other key I use a lot from Summits is the Teeny key uh, from America. Um, it's basically a couple of, is it beryllium kind of copper um, sprung contacts that basically on a, on a rod um, that just make contact with a screw head. They're very, very simple. Not a lot can go wrong with them. They're quite easy to maintain if you have any problems with it on the hilltop. Um, quite easy to play around with. So again, recommend something like that. But remember what I said about batteries in, in the cold. Um, if you've got a radio with a battery in it, that's great. But remember, if it's cold, there's not a lot you can do unless you can fit that radio under your arm. Whereas if you use a separate rate, a separate battery, and I tend to do this, I have a separate battery and I have the, the Anderson power poles on absolutely everything so that it all interconnects. If you've got a separate battery and a bit of a, um, a, a little bit of length on your power lead, you can chuck your battery inside your jacket next to your body, keep it warm while you're operating um, in cold conditions, and that will just keep your battery um, uh, running along a little bit happier. So we've done a bit of radio, we've done a little bit of antennas, we've looked at batteries, we've looked at keys. I guess the last thing we need to look at from the point of view of activating a summit is um, spotting yourself and logging. So spotting yourself, you can just go up on a hilltop and start calling CQ SOTA and someone will eventually find you and bless them when they do, they will probably spot you. And I thank every, every chaser that spotted me, I thank. You can really tell the difference because suddenly you'll have been calling for 10 minutes with no one answering and suddenly it's like you're the precious DX and you've got everyone calling you, it's great. But you can spot yourself um, if you have uh, data access from your phone on top of a summit, you can just go to the SOTA data website and use their web interface to enter a spot. If you haven't, if you've got marginal coverage and it allows you to do SMS, you can make use of, there's um, an SMS to SOTA data, SOTA watch portal uh, which you can subscribe to and it allows you to send these cryptic looking sms's to a particular number and what this is doing is it's taking my hill reference which here is um is this leith hill i oh, know walbury walbury hill oh yeah sorry which is g stroke se dash zero zero one and what i do is i put it in in this format and it beautifully formats it and posts it for me so i use this basic format when it appears on the website it looks great so I can spot myself using SMS. If you're a CW user and you've gone to the SOTA watch site and entered a planned operation to say, I think I'm gonna be on this hill at this time using these bands. And I set up on my radio and I call CQ SOTA from G0POT. If RBN picks me up, there's a portal into the SOTA watch and it will automatically um, spot me from RBN. So as a CW operator, it's fantastic. If I've 
pre-planned the, um, the, the activation. All I don't even have to bother spotting myself. I just call CQ SOTA D G0 POT and it automatically spots me, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, can you send a link to registering um, using this format? Yes, I can. I'll have to look it up. I found it on the um, SOTA forum, but I will find it and I will sh I get it shared and I will find out from Nick afterwards how to make sure you guys all get that. Um, I don't know whether people do it in different countries, but I guess uh, the UK number, I think it's a guy in Scotland that uh, manages it. I guess it doesn't matter. We can all text the same number and it's going to work. So I'll get that um, shared with you guys. Yeah, no problems, Tristan. Um, so that's the spotting. And, and like I said, it, it, operating SOTA is like being rare DX. You know, if you go operating portable, you'll know that sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge getting a contact. Um, especially if the bands are poor or if they're a bit crowded. Um, conversely, it can be difficult getting heard. When you're a SOTA operator and you get spotted, <laughs> it is just chaos. Um, everyone descends upon you. And when you're a first time CW operator giving it a go, it's terrifying because suddenly you've got thousands of people calling you at the same time. But it's great experience and it's, it's good fun. Um, as the activator, you are completely in control. So um, I know when I did my first few CW activations, I was a bit nervous. I'd never done anything like that before. I was terrified people were coming back at 30 words a minute, which is a bit quick for me. But actually, I'm the DX. I'm in control. If you don't come down to my speed, if you don't operate in a way where I can understand you clearly, I just won't work you. And it's as simple as that. And people very quickly fall into line um, and, uh, and work at uh, your speed and how you want to do it. So um, when it comes to, ah, uh, yes. Yes, you just you found my website. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. Um, when it comes to uh, logging, Logging is a personal choice. I am a paper and pencil logger. So I take a little um, moleskin notebook um, and a pencil. I don't use a pen because in the cold it won't write and in the hot it leaks everywhere. Um, a pencil will work even when it's raining and your pages are getting wet. Um, I have been out in some atrocious conditions and I've never had a problem writing on a normal notebook. Now you can get waterproof paper, um, but I've never found the need for it. I just, you know, lean over the book um, and chuck it in the bag when I'm not operating and it's it's fine. It gets a bit wet, but nothing bad. Um, you'll also notice there's a little bit of paper stuck out the side here. Before I go and operate, I print all the key details of the summit, my call sign, now you think, well, you know your call sign, but if I'm operating Wales, I need to remember that I'm GW0POT and not G0POT. Um, so I, I tend to, if I'm operating out of my normal association, I put the, um, the extra identifier for the country I'm in. I might put the hill reference, um, the work to all Britain identifier for wherever I am, the trig point ID if I'm near a trig point and can, can activate that at the same time. I put all that information on a bit of paper and I glue it into my book because if I don't glue it, that is going to blow away the second I open this book because well, I'm on a hilltop and it's windy. So it's glued into my book. I can open it up like that and now I can turn the pages, keep logging for a couple of hours and I can always see all of my um, hill data, which is, which is really, really important. Um, the other option, of course, is computer logging. This is James uh, M0JCQ. I hope I've got that right. Um, he prefers to do logging on his tablet. Um, he's got a waterproof case on that, which you are definitely going to need. He does struggle sometimes in the sunlight, but um, he's got used to that now and he, he seems to make that work for him. The, the joy of that for James is when he, he gets back and wants to upload his logs, um, he can do that at the press of a button, whereas I'm going to have to transcribe mine into something. So, um, so, so logging's um, completely a personal choice. And um, Tristan was just saying, watch Android. I'm, I'm, your mention of Android makes me want to say, oh, yes, don't forget you can log on phones as well. There's quite a few phone logging apps, so you don't even need to have a pad with you. But um, 
yeah, I'm just using my Garmin watch for um, timekeeping there. The other thing is, obviously, when you're on a hilltop with lots of clothing on, keeping you warm, your watch is tucked away inside and you can't see the damn thing. So um, I, I'm still looking for a nice little watch or something that I can clip onto my notepad there and have externally so I don't have to um, take my watch off every time. So you've done your spotting, you've been spotted, you've operated, you've worked loads of stations, you tend to get these little bursts of traffic where you'll get maybe um, 20, 30, 40 QSOs, you'll, you'll run for about 40 minutes and then you'll get a little quiet spot. You've worked all the main traffic, other people have got bored and wandered off and you'll take a little break, normally stand up, get a little bit of blood back into my backside, jump up and down a bit to warm up and then maybe go back in and have another session or try another band. Once you're done, the last thing that you need to do is to upload your results on the sotadata.org.uk website. So this is where you're going to upload your logs. If you've been a clever cookie like James, you can just upload an ADIF file. If you've been like me and written it on paper, you now have to transcribe it, but it's very, very easy. All I have to do is put in the time and the call sign of the person I've operated. Typically, I've stayed on the same band and I've stayed on the same mode. So all I do is type in time, call sign, add, time, call sign, add. So it's fairly quick to, to add, you know, if I've made 40 contacts, it's only going to take me a couple of minutes to put them in. So you enter all your data in here. Um, as a chaser, you put them in as, as a chaser um, points. As an activator, you submit an activation log. And if you've had summit to summit contacts, you log those separately as well. You don't include them as your um, normal activation contacts. You put them in separately as a summit to summit log. And then afterwards, you can click on the buttons at the top here and see reports of all your activities, all of your points for chasing um, activation and summit to summit. Um, you can look where you are in a big standing order of everyone or per country. You can see where you are against all your friends to see if they're beating you and you need to quickly get out and do a summit or whether you're beating them and you can um, have a laugh at them on Twitter. But uh, that's, that's the final step and you get to do that while you're sipping your coffee, uh, your cocoa uh, with your slippers on, which is even better. Um, what does uh, Richard say? Um, OUTD log is excellent for SOTA on Android. Okay, um, I've not come across that actually. There are a few um, logging apps. I tend not to recommend because I don't use them, but uh, I have come across a few logging apps on, I use iOS. Um, I've got iPhone, but um, on Android, you've got much more choice, I think, for, for uh, phone logging. Um, but yeah, super convenient because if you're taking the phone to do your GPS, to photograph yourself, making contacts for selfies um, and, and for all those other good things, then if you've got the phone, you, you can just get on and use it for logging. Uh, in which case, if you're going to do all those things, I would also recommend taking an external battery to, um, to pop onto your, <laughs> to your phone. Right, I think I'm almost out of time, aren't I? So let me um, just go to the final slide um, just to see if there's any questions. Just to reiterate, um, if I've covered a, a few different um, URLs today on the, on, on the presentation. However, this sota.org.uk, I think is a great starting point. You can find um, the general rules for SOTA and guidelines for operating, and you will find links to the um, Data Watch, the SOTA Watch uh, website, sorry, the SOTA Maps website, and the SOTA Data website. You'll find everything linked from that one website. Um, so it's a, a really good starting point. And the other one I use from the UK is um, streetmap.co.uk. Actually, the SOTA Maps website when you look at the maps on there you'll notice there's some little buttons in the corner of the map and it allows you to toggle between different views so if you're in countries where you haven't got access to online um, kind of ordnance survey maps with um, contour lines on them check out the SOTA maps website and see if you can actually see that um, on, on the SOTA maps uh, views because if um, if you can that would make an, an ideal resource um, if you're a Twitter user, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Um, I'm Dr. Orthogonal. I'm Dr. Orthogonal because I'm always right, apparently. Um, 
hopefully uh, I, I've got a little website. I don't do a huge amount on there, but I have uploaded information on my NFED half wave. Um, and I do tend to post a little bit about um, SOTA and, um, and, and doing some CW operating. Uh, and I have a, a YouTube channel, um, just uh, search for G0POT, where I tend to do equipment reviews. Um, again, a lot of CW stuff on there, um, but a lot of radio content. So uh, something I need to do a little bit more of, but um, hopefully something of interest there for you all. So at this point, let me sit back, take a sip of my, um, my juice, which looks like I'm drinking red wine, um, and see if there are any questions or comments. Brilliant. Well, Michael, thank you very much indeed. That was a really good presentation and uh, uh, thank you for that. Really interesting. Um, right. So usual way, we're going to open it up to any questions, uh, comments, contributions. So who wants to go first? Yeah, I've got one there, Nick. Yeah, go oh, on. Uh, Colin M0DUK first. Hey, Nick. Um, Thank you very much, Michael. That was a uh, first class presentation. Um, just a really, really quick question. Um, I was unaware of the MT3 uh, setup. Um, can you buy it in the UK? Does it come from the States? Is it built or can you buy it ready built? Is that the, the mountain topper are you asking about? Yes. The MT, yes. MTB3. Um, you can buy it from the UK. So it's, um, it's manufactured these days by a company called LNR Precision, who are American and um, lovely guys. They, they create some nice radios. But um, Kanga UK are um, uh, market their products as well. So Dennis from Kanga, if you do kangaproducts.co.uk, um, Dennis sells the uh, mountain toppers. The last time I looked, he had them in stock, but um, I've not looked at his website for a little while. So yeah, check it out on, on there. That's the best place to get them from the UK. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Nick. No problems. No problem. David, M0RIU. Yeah, hi, Michael. Thanks for the talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, just to reiterate the stuff that you were saying about safety, really. Um, I've done a few. I've done the, uh, the, the Yorkshire Three Peaks as activations. I've done Black Hill. Uh, twice once as a field activation the hill fitness thing absolutely Roger and Nick will both sort of agree that uh, I regular fitness I've got a reasonable amount but hill fitness cracky I really let the side down that day um, but not to be afraid to pull out if the weather turns bad uh, the first time I tried to do Penny Ghent I we got to the bottom of the vertical climb um, where you're going up the rock face and the wind was gusting at 50 knots no radio contacts worth that so just yeah. turn around and go home and not to belittle the english hills there there are people die every year on these on these summits absolutely right um, and even even places like black hill the mountain rescue team are called out there every year to somebody and not to be over reliant on mobile phones, you know, you need to be able to use a map, a compass, um, and and know how it works. And that was it, really. It was yeah, just and 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 have another way of um, raising the alarm if you have problems. Yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely right. Um, yeah, the hill fitness is an interesting one, isn't it? Because you you might think to yourself, yeah, I I can run ten kilometres. You know, that's uh, I'm fit, but actually climbing a hill is quite a different. Mm experience so um yeah i recommend starting small and and working up um and as you said don't don't underestimate how easy it is to get yourself into um trouble on a hill uh, no matter how simple it might seem i think a lot of a lot of, there's been a lot of problems recently as well where people have got a little bit lost and they've got a mobile phone so they dial 99 and ask for mountain rescue um, whereas if they didn't have a mobile phone, they would get themselves out of the trouble. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go downhill and keep going downhill, eventually you'll come to the sea. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's not a massive island, isn't this one? Well, it will take you a long time to get to the sea. <laughs> it will take you a long time to go downhill and get to yeah. uh, get to civilization. But you're 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 absolutely right. You mustn't ever be unwilling to say. I, this isn't going to work. I'm going to stop. 
you have to you have to be prepared to do that and funnily enough the the, the photograph that i showed you earlier that from the um summer to Clough, when i started climbing that i got about halfway up and realized conditions were pretty dicey in places and I, I thought I've come a long way to do this. I've driven all the way to North Wales. Um, I'm climbing 10 hours to, to do these. I don't, I'm, I can literally see the summit. I'm that close to it. Do I want, do I really want to turn around? And actually I did, I turned back, um, but retraced my steps and found another safer route up to the, the summit. But uh, yes, it, it's difficult sometimes to say, no, I'm, I'm going to quit. I'm going to give up because uh, it, it, as you say, a radio contact just isn't worth it. Absolutely. The first time I did Black Hill, um, the approach that I used the second time I did it, which was an unsuccessful activation, there's, uh, you cross a little babbling brook with three stepping stones. And the first time I did it, it was thigh deep, a raging torrent. <laughs> you know, conditions can just change so much so easily. Anyway, I'll let somebody else have a go. Yeah, thanks very much, David. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, David. Um, Howard, WB2UZE. Uh, well, good evening, everybody in the UK. Just a couple of things before I uh, ask my question. Um, Nick, I wanted to thank you again for allowing everybody from the CW Club to come. It was very gracious to you. I counted 28 of us Yankees over here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a bit, and I'm very pleased with the, um, with the turnout. And, um, you know, it, it, like you said before, this is a great cooperation, and I think we found um, uh, ourselves here in, in the middle of uh, the Ethernet, um, Nick, and I look forward to a, a good cooperation on both sides of the pond. You know, it's, uh, as you said again, this is the future. This is it. I mean, why get in a car and drive when you can have a turnout of 70 something people here uh, to see a presentation, you know? It's, it's, it's really good. But having said that, uh, Michael, excellent uh, presentation. You know, um, we all know what it takes to put on these type of uh, things. I've done a few myself and it was excellent. I have one question. Here in the States, yeah. uh, we have a lot of summits that you can drive right up to the top. It would be yeah. like the handsy move without getting out and climbing. Is that considered cheating or it's, is that is that a legitimate uh, a soda? It's, it's absolutely legitimate. Um, and, and thank goodness there are places like that because as I said, if you're disabled and you can't climb, it gives you an opportunity to go and participate as an activator. Um, I personally always feel like I've cheated when I drive to the top of a hill. So I often park further down just so I can do some walking and some climbing. Um, as I said, so long as you don't operate from the vehicle, so long as you move away from it and all of your station is separate from it, it's no problem at all. It's completely legitimate. Okay. And make the, make, make the most of them because there are others that you sweat for an hour and you only earn one, one point. <laughs> well, we, we have a few here actually. Uh, Rich, you know, uh, and I, uh, K2UPS, we went to the highest uh, point in New Jersey once. Yeah. And, um, you know, we didn't do that on the soda, but you know, Rich, maybe we should do that. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Howard. Uh, right, who else has got a question or comment to put to uh, Michael? I, I have a comment, Michael. Uh, this is Walter. Uh, Hi, Walter. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, no problems. Go for it. Okay, uh, in, in the soda activations that I have done, Okay, uh, you mentioned earlier on to make sure you bring everything with you when you get there. I need to comment on this. Also, police the area and don't leave anything behind. Very good point. Um, I, had an, I had an unfortunate opportunity with one of my QRP radios, which uh, each band requires you to insert a band chip which I kept in a small bag. Uh, I left that summit, put that radio away for a while. When I went to use it again, I couldn't find the band chips. I only had the 40 meter chip in there. Uh, I realized that I had left them on the top of uh, Lake Balsam Mountain. So check and make sure, I know it sounds silly, <laughs> but make sure you leave you, you police your area and take everything that you brought with you yeah. back down with you. Just a comment. <laughs> Wonderful presentation, Michael. Great. Thank you very much. 
No, thank well, you very much, Walter. I, I hope as good chaps always say spot on. <laughs> I hope I hope I got my pounds and ounces right. Apologies, we um, we metricized here and uh, try, trying to remember the pounds and ounces is it's it's all a bit um, far in the distance now. But you know, you're you're it's so true. And, and just from a general, um, you know, we're one of thousands of people who go and visit these wonderful outdoor spots. Um, it's, it is really important to make sure you, you don't do any damage and you don't leave stuff behind. Obviously, you don't want to leave any radio kit behind. That would be a disaster. But um, even bits of PVC tape that I use to hold my antennas, um, bits of string, anything that I've used, I make sure I pocket and take away with me. Um, I operated... Um, uh, last year from another Welsh mountain called uh, Penny Van. Um, and uh, I, I must admit, I was, I was just, it was a very popular hill, thousands and thousands of families um, climbing it um, and, and enjoying it. But my God, there was a lot of rubbish at the top with water bottles and crisp packets and things like that. I, I filled two bags on my way back down the mountain of rubbish. So Picking up after yourself is really, really important, but don't forget your um, your radio modules. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Walter, for that reminder. Right, uh, and we've all done it. Right, uh, anyone else got a question for Michael? May I? If if I'm not, if I don't see you straight away, just unmute yourself and go straight. It's away. William. Is it William? Richard. Oh, oh Richard. Yeah. Hello there. Good evening. Hi, William. Um, yeah, some of you was mentioning Black Hill. Um, I've done that twice, and I've always got lost on there twice because it's a flat hill. It's got those undulations. If you're coming from uh, Old Moss, you know the big transmitter that you see. When you get over, you get beyond that. It's just flat land. There's nothing, and you always get lost, which is why. As you said, always take a map, compass, GPS, because it's amazing how, no matter where you walk there, you've got these rivulets which can hide your line of sight. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. system like pinpointing where you are. It can be a real. It can be a real challenge. In yeah. fact, I've I've had I've I had even worse challenge where. I was driving down to the southwest of England and uh, I knew I was going to be passing a SOTA summit. So I chucked the bag in, but I hadn't prepared maps. So I knew roughly where I needed to be. And I, I kind of looked at uh, my GPS and worked out where I might be able to park. And I drove to where I knew the hill was. And there was really low cloud. You couldn't see anything over about 100 feet. It was um, really low cloud base. And I couldn't find the actual hill. And I even stopped and asked people, um, do, you know, do you know where this hill is? The lo local people. And they like, no, no, not, never, never seen a hill around here. <laughs> it, was, it was right next to us. <laughs> And I just I couldn't find the damn thing. <laughs> yeah, it's like um, you can't, can't see the wood from the trees with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling. I tried to do American Scotland, and uh, you know, cloud came in because we were right down at the bottom. You go about four or five hundred meters up, and then you go no trees, and that is when the cloud is, and you've got no point of reference. And yeah. That, you just, yeah, you, 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 you haven't got any point of reference. And if you can't see very far, it is very, very difficult to see where is up. Um, it's, it's way more challenging than you would think. Okay, anyway, thanks for the... Uh, thank no problems, William. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, William. And incidentally, I mean, Black Hill, uh, you won't know it, Michael. It's in the Southern Pennines. Uh, it's Sierra Papa 002. It's, uh, there's a massive space on the top, which is actually within the Sota Summit area. So it's, it's a huge area you can, you can walk around on and, and you're well within the yeah. uh, 25 metres vertical. Because if you've ever been up Kinder Scout in the Peak District, another one of the Peak District Hills, you know, again, there's a massive amount of area, which is all part of the summit. You don't have to be next, dead next to the actual summit point to be activating there. But so yeah, I take your point, Michael. And if it gets foggy up there, you've got problems. Uh, William, rather. Uh, who else uh, had a question? Yeah, Richard, RBG. Yeah, good evening, Mike, and thanks very, thanks very much for a fabulous presentation. Uh, I'm not able to climb uh, an ideal world white flora and fauna. 
um, and your preparation, execution is exactly what I do. The yes. difference is I sit on the back seat of my car with the radio in front of me, the laptop on my knee in the height of luxury. But it's just as, just as much fun uh, as, as you'll find with that. So thanks very much indeed. Absolutely fabulous talk. No problems. I've worked quite a few other stations doing the fauna and flora um, quite often when I'm SOTA operating. And in fact, I've had people who have both been doing a SOTA summit and giving me the flora and fauna reference for the area they're in as well in, in other countries. So, um, yeah, it seems quite a, it seems to be a building um, activation um, that a lot more people are getting into. Yeah, it's really good fun. And I remember one of the comments you made, how do you start? Uh, and I asked the question, how do you start? Call CQ Worldwide Flora Fauna or CWWWFF and you'd be amazed at the pilot. It's fabulous. <laughs> uh, it really is. But, but thanks again, super presentation. Fantastic. Thanks so very much, Richard. Cheers. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Anyone else with a question for Michael? Just looking around. Not so much a question, Michael, but uh, just thanks very much for the for the talk. And also, uh, now Walbury Hill is is also my local summit, so possibly ah, I'll excellent. see you up there someday. Yes, yes, yeah. Whereabouts are you located? Where are you based? Uh, I'm now in Reading. Now, oh, okay, yes, just down the road from me. So I'm yeah. I'm so I I, I I used to be actually just basically where the Derby Dale Club is, although I had no contact when I was up there. And I, uh, but now I'm down here. I'm I'm in that area. Excellent. I'll have to meet up for an activation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm mostly two meters SSB, but uh, yeah, it's 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 good fun. It's... You've, you've prompted me to have a go again. Actually, it's been several years since I've been up there. What well, Walbury Hill and um, Coombe Gibbet, which yes. you made just a few hundred meters away, um, yeah, they 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 are fantastic for VHF. Yep. Um, and if I'm going to go and do some um, six meter or two meter VHF SSB or CW, fantastic place to go locally. Yeah. It's the best uh, place to go locally. Absolutely. I just had a look actually at my last log there, and I've it included uh, France, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, yes. and uh, Southern Ireland, all from all in one activation from Walbury Hill on two meters SSB. Fantastic. And up north, <laughs> you guys, I'm so jealous of the uh, the hills you have up there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've we've got very little down here and they're all yeah, one yeah, point yeah. hills. You, you've got all the good stuff up north. And you guys in the US as well, you you have got yeah. some, I know you've got some areas which are very mountainous and some that are very flat, but if you happen to be in the mountainous areas, you have got some amazing hills. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, no Russell. Problem, Russell. Thank you. Okay, anyone else with a question or comment to Michael before we call us that? Yeah, Gerald. All right, just a quick one. Thank you very much, for Michael. First of all, it's really good that, in, really interesting. Long time since I've been up hills, getting tempted to try it again. However, one thing I, I thought what might be an idea is when, when some members like a local club or other people that you know in amateur, get them to monitor the frequency when you're up the mountain, then if the mobile phone fails, which it does on a few around here, then you've got an alternative way of communicating a problem. Yes, and, and I also know some people who use um, APRS um, to track their position as they're climbing and descending hills and their local friends can then monitor them um, to spot where they are. Yeah, I, I think so long as you so long as you're not doing it completely in isolation and somebody knows that you're going and when you should be back um, is always a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, Tristan. Uh, just one last, uh, uh, just uh, like to thank you, Michael, for the um, insight you've given me of the and to everybody across the pond, uh, a very good um, presentation on SOTA. Um, I hope to work you from a hilltop as well as Nick, which I hope will be, I don't want to put the Welsh borders on the map, HI, but I, but, <laughs> but anyway, it, maybe that, that chance will come. But I have activated one Welsh mountain uh, with my friend who I put the link up to, GW4VPX, who you yep. may have worked, Alan, his name is, to everybody. 
And I've had a lot of inspiration um, when I activated that first mountain top um, in a matter of 20 minutes while I was there with, where after he'd finished and he's, and with that, you know, it's very like you're dependent. Obviously, you need data coverage and things to use yeah. to send your spots. But like you say, with that capability of sending attacks to, if most probably, if you've got cellular network or whatever, rather than got to rely on your data. Yes, the the text tends to. Um, Places where I can send text, I don't always, I'm not always able to send data or connect no. to via the website. So um, uh, it's and, really, really helpful. Yes. And like you say, I think that would help me because I don't want to be faffing it when it's checking down yeah. with rain in yes. getting an internet connection. So maybe you could find that thing and let Nick. I, I will make sure I forward that on. And well, Tristan, I, I hope my Welsh pronunciation wasn't too oh, <laughs> too far off tonight. No, it was fine. And that <laughs> that other one you were referring to was Penavan. Penavan. Penavan, yes. That is another nice remote location as long you know, in the Welsh borders and along as the Black Mountain and those. All my all my friend has done all these and he's he, if you look at everybody looks at his website if they want to you'll see the activations and some marvelous views yeah so yeah, with that Penavan Penavan is very very busy gets a lot of tourists yes. to the top of it across the road from it is another summit called Fan Four um, Van Vauer, yes. Van Vauer. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to learn the pronunciations at least. Van Vauer, and which is fantastic because no one goes up there. It's it's completely uh, quiet. But yes. it's one of those hills where you look up and you think, "Oh yeah, I've not got too far to go." No. And then you climb over the ridge and you realise you've you're only halfway there. You've still got no. a hell of a climb ahead of you. So yeah, thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, registering to receive it yeah. so that I can use that. I'll make, sure, I'll make sure I get that over to you, Tristan, all right? Yeah, my email on QRZ anyway. Okay. No thank problems. You, thank you, Mr. Thank you. Cha thank you, Mr. Chairman. No problem, Tristan. Right. Anyone else for the final before we uh, call it tonight? Nick, just a quick uh, abridgment. I I'll let um, Michael tell the tale. Um, what, 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 what Mike forgot to tell, tell us on, particularly um, perhaps for any of our US friends that come to visit the United Kingdom, is um, the big hill that um, Tristan called Snowden has a little station on the top of it. I don't know if you want to tell the tale, Michael. Oh, yes, it does. It, it, so um, Snowden has a, a cog railway that goes to the top of it, and it's got a little steam engine and a little diesel engine, and it comes up from um, a village called Lamberis. Um, so it, actually, the, the, the climb from Lamberis isn't too... It's tough, but it's fairly well trodden. A lot of people take that as a route up. But yes, um, during the summer months, you can catch the train to the top to save you doing the climb, <laughs> which I've never done. I've never done that. I always climb it. <laughs> it gets very busy when the, when the train goes up there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very busy. I've always activated it, uh, climbing from Ridley and going up... Uh, before the train arrives and, and then have a coffee yeah. and head that's, off. That's the best way to do it. I, and, and I must admit, I've only ever be, I've only ever activated it um, on VHF because it was so busy. I didn't yes. want to put antennas yes. up and it was thick with snow and I, it was going to be difficult anyway. But yes, um, much easier on two meters um, with all the people there. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, call it a night to the formal bit of the meeting. Before I do, uh, I'd like to show our appreciation to Michael for a very, very interesting contribution. And please feel free to uh, join in as you wish. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Michael. Very good. Really good presentation. Thank you. I'll send you the check in the post, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael, from Jim G3 YDL. Thank you, Jim. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you to Michael again. And Michael and I have been in contact and we'll, uh, mm -hmm. if he sends me through the uh, document with the links, I'll make sure that everyone can access it on the uh, 
uh, Denby Dale Facebook uh, page. And of course, the uh, recording of this uh, meeting tonight will go up onto our YouTube channel and on the Facebook page as well. So uh, uh, for those of you that missed some of it because you got in a bit late, uh, uh, you can go and see it there. And uh, Howard and uh, our friends there from the Long Island CW Club, it was great uh, to see you and uh, your members again this evening. And long may the cooperation between our two clubs continue and flourish over the coming uh, weeks, months and years. Uh, I think we can all learn so much, can't we, from each other, from our different life experiences and different radio experiences and different parts of the world. So it's, it's great uh, to see visitors to our meetings uh, from uh, literally across the world, as we had uh, from Australia to uh, the United States and, and all points in between tonight uh, on, on the air. So uh, thank you very much again, Michael. O on that note, I'm going to uh, just uh, stop the recording. <laughs>